saved. It's just as real this morning as it's ever been. There's a place prepared for the devil and his angels called hell in the Bible. It's never been changed. It's never been air conditioned. It's never closed its doors, went out of business. Now the Bible said here, Job chapter 18, in verse 21, I want you to look at it. Job chapter 18, look down at your Bibles there. Job chapter 18, verse 21. Everyone listen carefully. Surely such are the dwellings of the wicked, and this is the place of him that knoweth not God. I'd like to preach to you this morning on the subject, Hell, the everlasting home of the lost. The doctrine of hell is being taken out of our thinking, out of our teaching, out of our preaching, out of our thoughts more today than ever, ever, ever before. The emphasis is being placed on living now. Even in Christianity, you'll notice that most seminars, most Bible conferences, most uh, the ninety percent of the emphasis is on how we can succeed now and make the best out of our life, and, and that is needful and necessary. But uh, many people are forgetting there's a hereafter. They're forgetting that life doesn't end. Scientists are arguing over when life begins. Doctors are arguing over when life begins. There ain't no argument over when life ends. It don't end. You live forever somewhere. Everybody in here is going to live forever and ever and ever and ever somewhere. You can't have in without an out. You can't have a cold without a hot. You can't have an up without a down. You cannot have a positive without a negative. You cannot have good without bad. You cannot have fast without slow. You cannot have soft without hard. You cannot have light without dark. I mean, there's all kinds of opposites in the world. And my friends, you cannot have heaven and no hell. If there is a heaven, there is a hell. If there is a God, there's a heaven and there is a hell. There's got to be a God because there's a creation and it's impossible for to have a creation without a creator. So we know there's a God. We know there's a heaven. We know there's a hell. Every once in a while, I go to church all the time, and it just every once in a while, it hits me that hell is so real. And when it hits you that hell is real, nothing else really matters except rescuing people from that place. Sometimes people think, what in the world do those people get out of going to church all the time? Why do they want to go up there three and four nights a week? Sometimes five and six nights a week. What do you get out of reading your Bible all the time? Praying, reading the Bible, pray, going to church, church. Let me tell you something, friends. If you really believe that hell is real and heaven is real, it will consume your life. It will be a life to you, not just something you do on Sunday mornings and put it out of the way until the next Sunday morning. I want to talk to you briefly this morning about the everlasting home of the lost. And the first thing I want to say is, how do we know that there is a hell? Now, two reasons I give to you this morning. The first one is, of course, the Bible teaches it. The Bible is the sole authority this morning. Whatever the Bible says is right. It doesn't matter what I say. It doesn't matter what you say. It don't matter what our kinfolks, grandmother, grandfather, scientist, doctor, lawyer, uh, historian, anybody says what the Bible says is right. It doesn't matter what person may think or see or feel or say. What God's Word says is right. The Bible said in Psalm 9 and verse 17 that the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. The Bible says in Daniel chapter 12 and verse 2 that some will be raised to everlasting shame and contempt. The Bible says in 
Matthew chapter 25 and verse 46, these shall go away in the everlasting punishment. The Bible said in Revelation 20 and verse 15 that whosoever was not found written in the book of life would be cast into a lake of fire. There is no about the Bible teaching there's a hell. If a man says, I believe the Bible, but I don't believe in hell, he is a liar. The Bible tells us there's a hell. The Bible teaches there's a hell. The Bible teaches in Hebrew. The Bible teaches there's a hell in Greek. The Bible teaches there's a hell in English. The Bible teaches there's a hell. Not only does the Bible teach it, but logic demands it. Did you know what logic is? Logic is something we have built in our brains and in our system. It demands that vice be punished. Logic demands that there be a punishment for sin. Even people who don't believe the Bible, when a man takes another man's life, they'll say, hey, that man deserves this or that man deserves that. Their logic demands that there is a hell. You can go to places where there are no Bibles. You can go to places where there are no criminal justice system. You can go to places where they have no police, no state, and no governing body, don't even have uh, pencils and paper in jungles. And they say if a man does a certain crime, if he steals something, they take him out and cut his hand off. They take him out. There's always have a logical punishment for wrongdoing. They sure do. That logic demands it. When uh, one of our preacher friends, uh, Larry Theophanopoulos, who's a missionary to Greece, his wife, Judy, sat on the airplane with Tom Selleck, who plays Magnum P.I. On, on television several years ago. And this Christian lady sat down and, you know, he was on the airplane and she thought, boy, if I can just, it was coming like from uh, uh, across the ocean home there only like eight or nine hours. She thought, if I can get to him, I'm going to witness to him. She got up and finally got to him and began to talk to him. She started going through the Bible with, with Tom Selleck. She began to talk to him about God and his soul and said, Do you believe in hell? And he said this. He said, I'm not sure about all of that, but he said, I know one thing. He said, If there is a hell, I'm going. And she said, she began, of course, began to talk to him. He, he began to cry. She had prayer with him. He confessed. His, he began to confess, get right with the Lord. And he tried to make that up to her and, you know, buy her a new dress and all that kind of stuff. But she, when they, I think when they got to Los Angeles, but did she begin to tell him, now that man knows, like everybody knows deep inside, that there is a place of retribution and punishment. Logic demands that there is a hell. Now let's talk about secondly this morning briefly. Everybody ought to know this. What kind of place is hell? What goes on there? You know, more and more and more and more as you listen to preachers on radio and television, they, th they say this. What is hell? Hell is eternal separation from God. Now that hell is that. That certainly is not all hell is. If a man preaches that hell is just separation from God, he's liberal in his thinking and in his preaching. You can, uh, there's a lot of people don't mind a bit being separated from God. They wouldn't even be happy in God's presence. Being separated from God forever would be just fine with most people I know. There's not much hell in that. Although hell is a place of separation. You'll be separated from loved ones. You'll be separated from from us that you knew here who went to heaven and you didn't make it into the city of God. Loved ones will be brought up before the great white throne judgment and their record will be read off. Down here on earth they said, I'll live without God. I'll live the way I want to live. And God will say, all right, you're in this place where you will live without me forever. Listen. And ever and ever. You're living without God. Forever. Not only is it a place of separation, it's a place of suffering. Most intense. Jesus said, the fire is not quenched. It is a furnace of 
fire. The rich man said, he said, oh, send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am what? Tormented in this flame. I've heard people in hospital. Boy, I've been going down the hospital hallway before. I remember one time I was up here and somebody had been shot and they were in there and they were screaming. And there I've heard screams going up and down those hospital hallways. And boy, it just make your blood curdle. I mean, it just it'll send cold chills up and down your back when you hear somebody screaming in pain. Have you ever seen them bringing in somebody out, out of a car wreck? And they bring them down to the emergency room and they're in there just going, ah, no, like that. Boy, I'll tell you, it's a scary thing. That's what they're doing in hell this morning. That's what they're doing while you and I are here enjoying this service and enjoying air condition and water fountains and restrooms and cars and a good uh, uh, dinner after a while. That's what they're doing in hell. It's a place of suffering, in pain, fire, the bush burn and was not consumed. So a man's soul in hell burns and is not consumed. It's a, death is a monster here on earth. Death is our most dreaded monster here would be a welcome angel in hell fire. They'd love to have death come to them in hell but can't die. If uh, Listen, they burn and scream forever. I heard about this lady who had an alcoholic husband and he was down to bar room one night and he went in there to the bar and him and his friends were kind of talking and cutting up and one of them got to talking about church and he said, my wife is a Christian and the man looked at him and he said, oh, don't give me that stuff. They ain't no real Christians. They're all a bunch of hypocrites. Ain't none of them live right. And that man said, I beg your pardon. My wife's a Christian. If anybody lives right, my wife does. And he said, I don't believe you. He said, I'll tell you what, I'll bet you right now, I'll bet you we can go over there at my house and get my wife out of bed and I can kick that bed and tell her to get up and fix me something to eat and she'll get up and do it and never open her mouth. And that man said she won't do it. There ain't a woman in the world get up for a no-count bum like you in the middle of the night and fix him something to eat. He said, all right, I'll bet you. They made a bet, went over to his house. He walked in the apartment in the middle of the night, goes in the room, hollering, scream, God! Fix me something to eat. I'm hungry. Three o'clock in the morning, that lady got up, went in the kitchen, started preparing breakfast and fixing. That a drunk's eyes got about that big around. He said, I can't believe that. He said, I can't believe it. I, I can't believe anybody in the world is that good of a person. And he began to talk to this woman. He said, ma'am, how can you possibly love somebody as sorry as your husband and be good to him like that? That Christian lady told turned and looked at that man. Hear what I'm getting ready to say, folks. That Christian lady turned. She looked at that man and she said, listen, sir. She said, my husband's not saved. My husband is not a Christian. She said, I'm a Christian. I'm going to heaven. I'm going to live with the Lord forever. But she said, my husband's going to burn. He's going to burn forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and never get out. I made up my mind that I was going to make his life as comfortable as I possibly could while he's still here on this earth. Oh, my friends, she realized that life is short and eternity is long and hell is a place of suffering. It lasts forever. You don't ever get out. A million years a billion years, 10 billion years. You'll never get out of hell if you die and go there. They say you can illustrate it like this. It took a diamond the size of this earth and an eagle come by and brushed his wing on that diamond and he flew out around the earth and 1,000 years later, he flew by and brushed his wing on that diamond. And 1,000 years flew by and brushed his wing on that diamond. When that eagle wore that diamond down to the size of a marble, then the people will still be in hell, still seeming, still burning, still 
hell crying out, God, have mercy upon me. Yes, sir, hell is a place of suffering. If that ever gets a hold of you, you'll thank God you're saved. And if that ever gets a hold of you, you want to get saved when you realize that hell suffers. Uh, people in hell suffer and you never get out. And it don't never end. Let me tell you something. God ain't never changed what he said in that book. I don't care what somebody told you. I don't care what a Jehovah's says or Armstrong on television. The Bible said that it's forever and the Bible said they suffer. It's a place of memory. Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime. You imagine people in hell. I imagine there were teenagers last night. I imagine last night on Saturday night there was young people that got in a car. Maybe they had them some drugs. Maybe they had them some alcohol. And they got drunk. And they were driving down the road. And somebody said, hey, who a bunch of people out there on the side of the road? They're singing and praying. And they laughed as they went by here last night. And maybe that happened. Maybe there was a car accident. Maybe one of those same young people were killed or Early this morning, two or three o'clock in the morning, out on one country roads or around the lake somewhere. And as soon as that life goes out of that body, those demons grab that person's soul. They start taking them down into this big old pit. These doors swing open like this, and in they go. And you imagine the fire lit up like that, and they begin to scream, Oh my God, oh my God, I must have been crazy. I must have been crazy. Can you imagine right now, they're remembering going by a seeing the preaching, seeing the singing, and saying, no, no, God, no, no, God, this ain't true. This can't be happening. God, no. You'll remember every service you sat in. You'll remember every sermon you listened to. You'll remember every song you heard the choir sing. Your memory will torment you day and night forever and ever if you die and go to hell. And you do know that everybody in here is going to one of two places, heaven or hell. You say, I just don't believe a preacher ought to preach on hell. Well, that you, you are showing how, de how desperately ignorant you are. You have a serious lack of intelligence. If you think there's a place down there and that a preacher shouldn't warn people. A preacher is no good that won't warn people what's going to happen to them. If I saw you sitting out on the front porch of your house and you were swinging and there was a rattlesnake piled up right there and had his head got out and your, your foot was going out there toward him every time you swung, boy, do you, what kind of a person do you think I'd be if I just sit back and say, now, well, they don't like for anybody to preach to them. They don't want anybody judging them. I'll let them decide whether they want to get bit. I, but if, I don't care what you think about me. I'm going to say, hey, look out, look out. I'm going to try to warn you to get away from it. My friend, I can see something's booked this morning that's awaiting those that are not saved and I'm warning you, I'm warning you, God meant what he said. I'm telling you, you better listen. God meant what he said. I know people laugh about it. I know they make rock videos and have fire coming up and people like, they're making a big joke out of it. But I'm warning you, God meant what he said. He meant what he said. And your mama, your daddy, your brother, your sister, your son or your daughter who does not accept Jesus Christ as their Savior is going to that place. God never changed his mind. Can you imagine people turning down gospel tracks? Can you imagine people saying, Don't want to hear it! I don't want nobody! Talk to me about God! I bet you they wish they could hear about God now. Them's people over there praying for you. They're praying, God, touch that teenage girl over here. They're saying, God, get that man. They care more about you than you care about yourself. They care where you go when you die. That's what this church is here for. Listen, if you're looking for a church where you can just come in on Sunday morning and be real dignified, religious, you're in the wrong place. We're serious. 
We mean this thing. I mean what I'm preaching. I believe what I'm preaching. And I believe that God said in this book that every person that dies without Jesus Christ in heart goes to a lake of fire. It's a place of lowest association. People say, oh, I'm not a bad sinner. I don't belong in that crowd. You see them with child molesters and whoremongers and rapists and murderers. And they say, well, I, there's no way I could get the same crowd. You'll go to that same place where those same people are going. I heard about a preacher who asked a young lady. She was talking about crooks and criminals and, and people like that, you know. And she was a real kind of nice, dressed, well-to-do young lady. He said, how would you like to live with them forever? She said, no way, no way. She said, they're repulsive. I wouldn't want to be with people like that. He said, unless you get saved, that's the kind of person you'll, you'll live with forever. She gave her heart to Jesus. She got saved. Only that it's a place where men reap the harvest of their sinful lives. The Bible said there's weeping, there's wailing, there's gnashing of teeth. You, there's people here that will cuss each other. They'll find that person and say, you're the one that gave me my first drink. I hate you. You're the one that taught, taught me how to lie and cuss. And you taught me all the dirty things in the world. You're the one that took me to a dirty movie. You're the one that done it. They'll curse each other and, we, and bite and scream and claw on each other for it's just a madhouse. You can't imagine how horrible it is. You, In your wildest imagination in a horror movie, you can't imagine how bad the lake of fire is where people will go when they die without God. They'll, they'll reap what they sow. But let me say thirdly this morning, let me ask you another question. Who will go to hell? Who will go to hell? The Bible tells us that unbelievers, those that say I'm living a good life, those that say I'm I don't believe in Jesus. Those that say, I'm doing the best I can. I'm a good person. Send me to a place like that. You hear me this morning. The Bible said there is none good. No, not one. There is not one good person in this church. I'm not good. You're not good. People say, well, good people go to heaven and bad people go to hell. If that's true, nobody's going to heaven because the Bible said there's none good. No, not one. The truth is this morning, Saved people go to heaven. Lost people go to hell. Those that take Jesus go to heaven. Those that say no to Jesus go to hell when they die. It's all it amounts to. Christ rejectors. Somebody said, I don't drink. I don't cuss. I pay my bills. I do that. But you know what the sin that will send you to hell is? The sin that will send you to hell is being ashamed to accept Jesus Christ and admit that in front of people. And some people will. I've been preaching a lot of revival meetings and I've had young people stand and grab the back of the seats. And they'll look at their friends see if they're going to come. And then they'll look this way and see if they're going to come. I've heard them talk, say, well, you do, you do, 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 do. And they'll shake their head, no. And I'm telling you this morning, friends, you hear me well this morning. They are not going to heaven if they reject Jesus Christ. But let me say fourthly this morning, let me ask you another question. When does hell begin? Now there's some little controversial doctrine that I want to clear up, and that is this. Some people try to teach you that some, a lot of churches, some Christians believe that when you die, that uh, you lay in an unconscious state in the grave until judgment day, and that would hell way on out children in the future somewhere. Not so. Conscious suffering begins of the soul at the moment of death. The conscious suffering of the soul begins the moment you die. The body will not be raised until after the millennium at the great white throne judgment. For example, if a man sitting in here this morning, say a man in here 65 years old, all of a sudden, he grabs his heart. Pain shoot through him. He falls on the floor. Somebody runs in here, dials 911. They, they rush down here. Let's say when, before they even get in here, that man dies. Before those guys come running through that door, before they can get him hooked up to a machine, before they can take his body out here, he split second that life leaves his body, his soul moves out of his body and goes to hell. And brother, as a soul goes in, see your soul shake just like your body.
It's like a, you're like a football. You got outer, that leather, that's your body. Then right inside that, you got that tube, that soul. And in that, inside that, it's air, filling it up. That spirit, your body, soul, and spirit. Your soul is shaped just like your body. You say, how do you know that? Because when each man died in Luke chapter 16, his body went in the grave, his soul was in hell, and he was asking for a drop of water on his tongue. A soul is not just like a ghost. A soul has a tongue. A soul has fingers, has eyes, and it's shaped exactly like your body according to the Bible. So your conscious suffering of your soul begins the very instant that you die. If a man dies and lost without God, his soul leaves his body. It descends into hell and begins suffering immediately. Not only that, conscious suffering of the body begins at the great white throne judgment. At the end of the millennium, at the great white throne judgment, Bible said death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. So those souls are going to come out of hell. They'll be reunited with the resurrected body. Then they'll get an eternal body they'll live in forever and ever and ever. And death and hell will be cast into the lake of fire. Do you understand that? That's when hell began. I illustrate it like this. People, I've heard people say, I heard a man say not long ago, some TV preacher or something, he said, if you go out here and shoot somebody, you don't go to the penitentiary right then. You got to judge first. That man don't know what he's talking about. You know what happens if you go out here and shoot somebody this morning? You know where you go? You go to the county jail. Immediately. Before you're tried, before they hear your case, before you get a lawyer, you go straight to jail. Do not pass go. Do not pass East Court Street. Straight to jail. And as soon as you get in jail, you await judgment day. And when judge day comes, you come out and stand before the judge. Then the judge will hear your case and sentence you to the penitentiary. Now, hell and the lake of fire are two different places right now. Hell is the county jail. If a man dies in sin right now, judgment's already on him. He's already condemned. And he goes immediately to the county jail, which is hell. One day, when judgment day comes, he'll come out of jail, stand before the judge. The judge will sentence him to the lake of fire. You understand that? And that's his eternal sentence and eternal judgment. It's just like our court system now is a type and a picture of that. By the way, did you know that no casket in this town is made for a dead man? Every casket they've got up here is made for somebody that's alive right now. There ain't no casket made for a dead man. When, you're di when you die, they've done got the one you're going to be put in. And you think about this. The one you're going to be put in might be uptown right now. Just waiting on you. You say, preacher, all that scary talk just scary. Well, it ought, to, it ought to shake us up. It ought to shake us up as Christians. It ought to wake us up! Let me ask you one more question this morning. This will be all. How can you escape hell? How can you escape hell? Two things. If you've ever listened to anything any preacher said in your life, listen to what I'm getting ready to say. Young people, all you kids over here come on the bus. If you've ever listened to a preacher in your life, you listen to what I'm getting ready to say in the next three minutes. This will determine where you go when you leave this world. Sometimes I preach to crowds of people and there's just something comes over me and says, where are they going? Where are they all going to go? What's going to happen to all of them? And it just about feels more of a, a weight and I can stand on my shoulders. Because I feel like, God, is there something more I can do? God, is there something more I can say? You know, this morning the sad thing is the vast multitudes not listen.
two things I'm going to tell you as I close. You've got to do two things if you don't want to go to hell. And somebody needs to do them this morning. Number one, you've got to turn from your sin. God does not send you to hell. He don't want you to go to hell. You put yourself in hell if you choose to go there. You must turn from your sin. If you hold on to your sin, you're going to go to hell with them. They'll take you there. Man says, I don't want to help, but I'm going to party and I'm going to do this. And I'm going to live it up. I'm going to live a, a promiscuous lifestyle. And I'm, going to be a, I'm going to be a homosexual. I'm going to be this. I'm going to be that. You cannot come to God until you're willing to let go. What you know. Now, I'll tell you something. There ain't no sin in this world worth going to hell for. Man comes up and tries to beat on heaven's door. Let me in! Oh, you can't come in. But mama's in there. Daddy's in there. You can't come to heaven without turning from your sin. Number two, you've got to turn to Jesus Christ. You've got to turn to Jesus Christ. He's the only way in. He's the only hope. He that hath not the Son shall not see life. He that hath not the Son hath not life. Your goodness will not keep you out of hell. You could come down here and join this church this morning. That's not going to keep you out of hell. You can be baptized every creek in this county and still die in your sins and go to hell. You can be good as you can possibly be and pay your bills and do what's right and, and be honest and upright and all that kind of stuff and still not go to heaven when you die if you don't come to Jesus. Sitting over here listening and he heard him say that, and he started thinking about it. He started thinking about it, and he went to church and got saved. Archibald Ball was a, was a gang leader many, many, many years ago, back in the 1800s before they even had cars. And Archibald Ball, they called his club the Hell Club. And they were so wicked. They'd been all kinds of sin and wickedness. And one night... Uh, after their annual meeting, Archibald Ball went home. And he laid down and went to sleep, and he had a dream. And in this dream, he's like this grim reaper to him with a big mowing sign, like death come over him. And he said, I'll get you in a year and a day. And for a few days it bothered him. He was so tore up he wouldn't even come out of his room. The, the, the dream was so, so real. It shook him up so bad he wouldn't even hardly go out of the house. Finally, after a few weeks, he started coming out and he'd eat a little bit and everything after he got over the shock of it. And he told him, boy, he straightened up there for a while. And people said, man, what in the world happened to you? He didn't want to talk about it. God shook him up in that dream that night. In a year and a day, I'll have you. And so time went on and after a few months his life kind of got back to normal. He never did get saved, never did get right with the Lord. And it started coming to their annual meeting again. They sent out the invitations and everybody was talking about they said our, our, our yearly meeting will be held one day late this year. It's leap year. It's been one year and a day since we met last and when he read that, cold chills went all over him. But he kept saying, it's coincidence. It's coincidence. This is not going to happen. This is not going to happen. See, you can keep telling yourself and telling yourself, it's not going to happen to me. It's not going to happen to me. It's not going to You're just from yourself. It can happen. It will happen. It's happened to a bunch of people since we was here last Sunday. And so the meeting came, and he went to it, and he was real nervous acting, and he wasn't himself. And they had their meeting, and... Everybody was wondering what was wrong with him. He left on his horse. The next morning, they found his horse grazing in the, on the side of the road there, eating some grass. And his stiff body laying on the side of the road. I don't understand that kind of stuff. But I know one thing. God will give you so many chances to get saved, my friend. And you, you, you ain't, we're not in this. This ain't no game we're messing with. This is serious business. There is nothing in the world more serious than being saved. Let's bow our heads for prayer. 
Every head's bowed. Every eye is closed. No one's talking. No one's looking around. Christians are praying. I wonder this morning, is God speaking to you? Huh? Is the Lord speaking to you this morning? Do you know that you're saved? You say, Brother Danny, I ain't never heard nothing like that in my life. That's exactly why God brought you here this morning, so you could hear it. Please don't go to hell, friend. Why don't you make up your mind this morning you're not going? Why don't you? Why don't you? What's stopping you? What's holding you back? Why don't you make up your mind this morning this is going to be it? This is the day you're going to come to Jesus. Turn from your sins. Turn to the Lord Jesus. Can I ask you a question? We're going to pray. We're going to stand and sing. Is there somebody here this morning? I see many of you. It looks like God's dealing with you. There's folks in here wiping tears this morning, friend. Christians pray. Is there somebody here this morning say, Brother Danny, I want it. I want this church to pray for me. I want this church to pray for me. I'm not ready to meet the Lord. I'm not ready to meet the Lord. I don't even know if I'm saved or not. Please. Please pray for me. Would you slip up your hand this morning? God bless you, ma'am. God bless you. God bless you, sir. God bless you, sir. Anybody else? Anybody else? Christians are praying. Heads are bowed. Eyes are closed. This is serious business, man. We're not going to come to you. We're not going to embarrass you. We're just going to pray for you. Would you slip up your hand? Come on. Slip it up. Take it right back down. Nobody's going to put you on the spot. God bless you, ma'am. God bless you, ma'am. God bless you, young lady. God bless you. Thank you for being honest. That's seven or eight hands. Somebody else, right quick. Come on, be honest now. This this won't see you. All right, I see your hand back there. Is there another? Is there another? Okay, I see yours, young man. I see yours. Christians pray. Christians pray. Listen to me. You that raised your hands, listen to me. It's never going to get no easier. It's never going to get no easier than what it is this morning. Why don't you do something about it? Why don't you say, I don't want to go to hell. I'm, I'm tired of living my life like this. I'm going to settle it. I'm going to make sure this morning. You can get out of your seat. You can walk down here. You can get down on your knees. And you can settle this thing once and for all and forever. And walk out these doors. No, we're going to pray for you. And then when we stand and sing, why don't you come? Why don't you just come out of your seat? Why don't you just make your way down here and say, Oh God, have mercy on me. It don't matter what nobody says. It don't matter what nobody thinks. It don't matter what somebody will think about you at work or, or think about you at school. Who cares, brother? All that matters is where you're going when you list world. Dear God, please, please move on this congregation this morning. Oh, God, do what I can't do. Dear God, do what I can't do. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord, this morning, I pray, Father, for these that lifted their hands. Lord, that they'd make their way down here to this altar. Lord, that they'd come to Jesus before it's everlastingly and eternally too late. Oh, God, that you'd pour out your power right now in this invitation. And, Lord, the Holy Spirit would grab and convict the hearts of those that are not ready to meet you. Help them to walk down this aisle and trust you as their Savior and put you first from now on on and forever. Oh, Lord, do it, I pray, Jesus' sake. Help them, Lord, to realize nothing else matters. Help them, Lord, to come. We'll praise you and thank you for it. In Jesus' name. While your heads are still bowed, I want to ask you this. Are you willing to do something about it? Are you willing to do something about it? You that lifted your hands, when we stand and sing, I want you to just come out of your seat. Come down here and let's pray. If you'll come, God will meet you here. There'll be somebody here from our church to be with you. And you can leave here this morning knowing good and well where you're going when you leave this world. Amen. Let's stand. Amen.